On a daily basis, we're being bombarded with information about COVID-19. But did you ever wonder about our grandparents and great-grandparents? How did they cope with the illnesses, minor and serious, that they developed? In my youth, back in the 1950s, it was TB was the big killer. My aunt died of it. She was only 32. Her oldest daughter, she was only 16. She died of it in 1953. The next child, her brother, he developed it. But my grandmother was determined that he wouldn't die. And she began to medicate him himself to a degree, right? Because it was a combination of drugs that eventually, back in the 60s, that actually defeated TB. They weren't available then at that particular period. And the only cure for TB at that time was, that's why they opened actually, uh, Arcane Hospital. It was a tuberculosis sanatorium. And people went there and the, the recovery was rest, inactivity, that means just lying in bed, and good food and two pints of Guinness for adults. Now, it's only quite recently that I, I found that out on the newspapers at the time. But uh, my grandmother used to send me down or go down herself, or my mother would go down to Fad Brown's down on Barrick Street. Down, Fad's was a pub down there. And she'd go and get what was called an invalid bottle. That's a small bottle of Guinness. And I always knew it when I was young, uh, a small bottle of Guinness, as an invalid bottle. I called it that for years. And she would mix that with a pint of milk. And I remember she used to have to catch my cousin's nose and hold it and uh, pour it down his throat, as they say, and drank it. But he did survive. He survived it. So there was lots of other. Now, in uh, Trinity College, not Trinity College, but University College Dublin, there's a, an amazing uh, collection called the School's Manuscript Collection. And in that collection are hundreds and hundreds of cures that were used back in the 1800s and indeed into the 1900s. And I remember lots of those cures. Now, the first thing I just talk about, just bear with me one second, was a thing called the blast. My grandmother was brought up in the County Clare and uh, she was what was called, this what she believed, overlooked. Now, I don't know if anyone have ever heard that expression, but overlooked was meant that there was somebody jealous of the child and when they looked at the child, they wouldn't say, God bless him or God bless her. And that was almost like a curse that was put on the child. That happened to my grandmother. And how do we know? Because in her teenage years, she developed what was called a blast. Now, again, you might have heard that expression, God blast you. Not used very much anymore, but I remember all the older people. It was a common expression, God blast you, boy. God blast you, girl. And my grandmother uh, developed a blast. She ended up up in the infirmary. And uh, it got so serious that they were going to amputate her leg. But her father went up took her out of the bed, brought her home and cured her with herbs. And she survived and no problem. She developed normally quite after that. But there's some absolutely brilliant uh, cures in the school's manuscript collection. At the end of the video, I put a link to that collection. So, St. Bridget's Day, 1st of February, my grandmother religiously would go out in the back up in Dial Street and on the line she'd hang some scarves and that was to put around your neck in the event of a sore throat. Now there wasn't much grass out the back but the little bit of grass that there was out there my grandmother would go out and she'd scoop her hands through the grass and the morning dew and rub it in her face and that was for good looks and she was a very good looking woman by the way. Uh, then we had St. Blaise Day because a lot of these cures were I suppose a lot of them were probably pagan, but it was mixed in with religion. And we, everybody is probably aware, we'd go down to the friary on St. Blaise Day, and the friar would get two candles, put it in a cross position like that, and put it on your throat to ensure that you wouldn't get a sore throat. And I have to admit, I rarely, if ever, had a sore throat when I was young. Now, there was also prayers then that were available for different ailments. A great one is, was for a toothache. And there was a little prayer that you said, and it said, St. Peter sat on a marble stone. Our Saviour came to him alone. The Saviour said, what ailed you, Peter? And St. Peter said, it's the toothache. That was the prayer to take away your toothache. 
Now, I don't mind saying a prayer, but I think I take a couple of salt pudding just in case. Now today we have tablets and potions to take away almost every ailment. At the slightest hint of a cold or hay fever, we can go into our chemist shop and take them to relieve the symptoms if it doesn't take it away. Uh, now, again, my grandmother was a woman in the house that, because we lived with, our, with my grandmother, she took care of all the medicinal things and all the herbal things. Like for boils, and I'm sure many people my age will relate to this, and probably even younger. If you had a boil on your neck, what was gotten immediately was bread, water, boiled water, and it made into a little ball, put it on your neck with a bandage around your neck, and when, when it dried, it would extract all the pus out of the boil. Another great cure that I remember many, many times, because I think when we, we were people my age, when we were small, we were relatively undernourished. We didn't get stuff with lots of vitamins, we didn't have vitamin tablets, we didn't have bananas, uh, anything like that. Apples would, would be rare, oranges would be very, very rare. So we didn't have any fruits that would give us vitamin C in that. So we suffered a lot with these little uh, corners of the mouth cracking and that, and the, the eyes, sore eyes. But what my grandmother used to do, if I had a sore eye, is she would get a pan, it was called the fasting spit. And when she'd, when she'd get up in the morning, she'd cup her hand like that and whoop, spit into her hand, as we say, a bit of phlegm. And she would rub it in her hand and rub it on my eyes like that. And that was the cure for sore eyes. It was called the fasting spit. So, like, my grandfather told me he was never at a doctor in his life. He lived to be 87, and the only time that he was ever at a doctor or had any interaction with the medical world was when he fell. I said he was aged 87. He fell down to the bottom of Bunker's Hill and he broke his hip and went into the hospital. And for a man as active as my grandfather, that was the end of him. So there was, there was lots, when I was young, uh, my father every Friday night would give us some uh, laxatives. It was syrup of figs, Cenopods. Cenopods were like sort of like tea leaves and pour the water and then you drink the water off the tea leaves. And the other thing, there was a small little piece of chocolate uh, called a brooklax. And all these three things. But in the event of those not working, there was another cure. And again, my grandmother was a woman for that. And I remember once that nothing would make me go. So the ultimate cure then had to be given. And that cures my grandmother, got a bit of soap, made me bend over and straight up the little passage where the sun doesn't shine. And my God, it worked. It's no problem. <laughs> but I was blown bubbles, as I said before, for a month. Now, here's, uh, here are a few of that were collected in the 1930s from the school manuscript collection. For convulsions in a child, small little baby. What you do is this, don't try this at home, not recommended. But this is from the 1930s, collected then. You get the child, turn it upside down, catch it by the feet and give it a good shake. That was for convulsions. Now for a sore mouth, a person was to be taken to one who never saw his father. Now what would you call a person who never saw his father? Well, there is a name. So that person has to breathe three times into the patient's mouth on Mondays, Wednesdays and Thursdays and that will cure the sore mouth. For sore chip lips the following is the cure. Clean part of the fire in the morning, in the hearth, the ashes. Give it a good lash, a go, here we go again, of the fasting spit and boil the potion. You need an awful lot of phlegm for that. Then apply to the sore mouth three times a day for three days. Now, there was a thing called, people used to call it chin cough. We know it as whooping cough. Again, I remember lots and lots of kids having that. And it was, it, because of the sound that a person made when they had that cough, they, uh, like that, they called it a whooping cough, but chin cough. So this is, again, from uh, the school's manuscript collection. Give sweet milk to a ferret. Now, that's a ferret. Do you know what a ferret they used to use years ago for hunting rabbits? And whatever the ferret doesn't drink, Give to the child for three successive days. A second cure for whooping cough was to stand on the road until a man on a white horse comes along. Now, 
A man on a white horse comes along. How long you be standing there on the fellow on a white horse comes along? I don't know, but it's a cure. So what you do is you'd ask him what the cure for the, the, the hoop and cough was. And whatever he tells you to do, you do. And that was a cure. It's unbelievable that people believe these, but they did. Their whole lives were ruled by these uh, religious and these, I don't know what you call them, superstitions, I suppose, the best word. Now, warts was the thing. Everyone I know when we were growing up had warts on the hands. Why we got them, I don't really know. I suppose some medical people out there can tell us. So I know what my grandmother used to do. And it was essential. Now, there was many, many cures for warts. And I suppose everyone said, but my grandmother had a different one. There was a ton of cures. What my grandmother used to do is go down to the butcher and steal a piece of meat. Now, it was essential that you stole it. You couldn't just ask the butcher for whatever reason, I don't know. But it was essential that the meat had to be stolen. A small piece. she come home and she'd rub the wart on my hand or my brother or my sister, whoever had the wart, go out in the back and bury it. And when the meat uh, would, would sort of like rot, the wart would be gone. So the next one was a cure for a stoy in the eye. Was to get a piece of gooseberry bush with ten thorns. Pint nine of them at the stoy. And then the one other one that was there would be the cure. For rheumatism, you get a bunch of nettles and beat yourself all over the body. Now, I'm sure when the pain went away that uh, you would feel an awful lot better. Another cure for a toothache, and this one I just can't figure out, consists of, of tobacco and a dead frog. Now, I don't know whether you wrap the frog, the frog into tobacco and smoke it or what, but people believe it worked. Now, for people who don't feel 100%, that was known years ago as a person is in decline. That means they're not that well. And uh, so they would look for a pick-me-up, as they called it. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that expression. So what they did was, you get flowers from a furze bush and buy in new milk. You strain and drink the milk. Another cure for decline was to put a patient asleep in a cowhouse. Outdoors. And that was, but I'm sure that uh, the next morning after sleeping in the cow house all night, you definitely would have to feel better. I suppose it beats, beats vitamin B. Now, if you had shingles, which I believe is very painful, you would get a black animal. Now, that could be a cat, a dog or a cow. And you would paint the shingles with the blood of the animal. Uh, you might feel better, but I'm not too sure about the cat or the cow or the dog. And yet... Some cures are very similar to what you would buy in the chemist today. So all cures for colds are similar to what we use today. For instance, an old cure for a cold is to take a currant or black lemon drink going to bed. Corrigine moss, boil it and take it with honey for a cold. For a chesty infection, you inhale furze balsam for a cold in the chest or the head, up the nose for these head colds. Now these remedies are still available in uh, Chemist Today. So, some, another, this is a great one for a wart, I just have to, have to tell you this. So if a person had a wart, this was the cure. You fill a bag with stones, the same number, as if you had 10 warts, you put 10, ba 10 uh, stones in a bag. You go down to the crossroads and you swing it over your head and throw the bag away. And the secret was, whoever came along and picked up those stones would get your warts. Another cure was to get a black snail and rub it on the wart and then pin the wart to the wall with a little nail or a pin or whatever. When the snail is withering, the wart is gone. A person who has licked a creeper frog has a cure for burdens. So that means anyone who ever licked a frog. Now, I never had the inclination to lick a, a creeper frog. I don't know what a creeper frog is, but any, I, I've never even, I've often held frogs in my hand years ago when I was young. But I never had an inclination to give one a good lick. But seemingly, if you did lick it, you have the cure for burdens. Now, if your sheep has a blind eye, it's called. So I don't know what a blind eye is in the sheep is. But there is a cure for it. A very simple cure. You spit in the sheep's eye. You mightn't be the sheep's friend any longer, but the sheep will be cured. So, another cure for thrush in the mouth is to get a child 
who never saw his father. Now we had that again for another cure. But this is one for thrush in the mouth, which would have been very common years ago with children. I don't know if it's very prevalent or at nowadays, I don't know. But get someone who never saw his father and uh, get him to blow in the child's mouth. So that should do the trick. Another cure for thrush in a child is to pass the child under a donkey three times. So let him walk in under the donkey's belly three times and that should cure the thrush. Uh, our cure for ringworm was to put three fur sticks in the fire and redden them. Take them out one by one and make signs over the ringworm, reciting a prayer at the same time, and this would get rid of the ringworm. And finally, the one I remember was that my grandmother with nettles. Now, she often and often went out the country and brought home nettles. And she would, uh, she would buy the nettles and she would wash her hair in it and have the nettles then as same as cabbage and there was another thing she used to do was that she used to go out to Tramore every September October and she'd go out and she'd bring a bucket out with her and she'd bring home a bucket of salt water from Tramore and you might say well why did she bring that home because at that time of the year the the seaweed in the in, 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 in the seaside releases the iodine and that was essentially for iodine. She used to also make lime water. She'd get lime and make lime. I remember every morning my grandmother gave me a small little timble full, small little glass, very small, full of lime water and that was for the skin. And my grandmother had absolutely beautiful skin. So she used to also wash her hair out of the nettles, uh, the, the water off the nettles. Again, all these, and I'm sure a lot of those, they sound very logical, the one about the iodine and the water sounds very, very logical, but a lot of them were sort of like nonsensical stuff, and I'm sure many of them did more harm than good. But they all survived, and they survived more importantly, to tell us the great stories of the great cures. Talk to you again soon.